partially out of curiosity and partially out of an inordinate fear becoming a pincushion for a possible second trap, Grignir plunged his torch into the exposed gap in the floor. The floor of a second chamber stood out seven feet below the glare. Tossing his torch through the aperture, Grignir grasped the side of an adjoining tile, dropping down. Glancing about the room, Grignir discovered that he had descended into the palace's mausoleum. Rectangular stone crypts cluttered the floor at evenly placed intervals. The tops of the enclosures were plated with thick layers of virgin gold, while the sides were plated with white ivory, at one time sparkling but now grown dingy through the passage of the rays of an all-encompassing mother time. Featured at the head of each sarcophagus in tarnished silver was an expungitively carved likeness of its rotting inhabitant. A dingy atmosphere pervaded the air of the chamber, which sealed in the enclosure for an unknown period had grown thick and stale. Intermingling with the curdled currents was the repugnant stench of slowly moldering flesh, creeping ever slowly but surely through minute cracks in the numerous vaults. Due to the embalming the bodies, uh, the flesh had decayed at a much slower rate than is normal, yet the nauseous odor was nonetheless repellent. Towering over Grignir's head was the trap he released. The mechanism of the miniature catapults was cluttered with mildew and cobwebs. Notwithstanding these relics of antiquity, its efficiency remained unimpinged. To the right of the trap wound a short stairway through a recess in the ceiling, a concealed entrance leading to the mausoleum for which the catapult had obviously been erected as a silent, relentless guardian. Climbing up the side of the device, Grignir set to the task of resetting its mechanism. In the event that a search was organized, it would prove well to leave no evidence of his presence open to wandering eyes. Besides, it might even serve to dwindle the size of an opposing force. Descending from his perch, Grignir was startled by a faintly muffled scream of horrified desperation. His hair prickled yawkishly in disorganized clumps along his scalp, as a cold danced along the length of his spinal cord. No mortal moral barrier, human or otherwise, was capable of arousing the numbing sensation of fear inside of Grignir's moldering soul. However, he was overwrought by the forces of the barbarian's instinctive fear of the supernatural. His mighty fuse had always served to adequately conquer any tangible foe, but the intangible was something distant and terrible. Dim, horrifying tales passed by word of mouth over glimmering campfires and skins of wine had more than once served the purpose of chilling the marrowed core of his sturdy-limbed bones. Yet the scream contained a strangely human quality, unlike that which Grignir imagined would come from the lungs of a demon or spirit, making Grignir take short, nervous strides advancing to the sarcophagus from which the sound was issuing. Clenching his teeth in an attempt to steal his jangled nerves, Grignir slid the engraved slab from the vault with a sharp rasp of grinding stone. Another long-drawn dry of terror and fested anguish met the barbarian, scoring like the shrill piping of a demented banshee, piercing the inner fibers of his superstitious brain with primitive dread, dread, and awe. Stooping over to espy the tomb's contents, the glittering accordion's nostrils were singed by the scorching aroma of a moldering corpse, long shot up and fermenting the same putrid scent which permeated the entire chamber, though multiplied to a much more concentrated dosage. The shriveled leathery packet of crumbling bones and dried flaking flesh offered no resistance, but remained in a fixed position of perpetual vigilance, watching over its dim abode from hollow gaping sockets. The tortured cries were not coming from the tomb, but from some hidden death below. Pulling the reeking corpse from its resting place, Grignir tossed it to the floor in a broken mangled heap. Upon one side of the crypt's bottom was attached a series of tiny hinges, while running parallel along the opposite side of a convex railing like protuberance, laid so as to appear as part of the interior surface of the sarcophagus. Raising the slab upon its brawn hinges, long removed from the gaze of human eyes, Grignir perceived a scene which caused his blood to smolder, not unlike bubbling molten lava. Directly below him, a whimpering female lay stretched upon a smooth surface to marble altar. A pack of grassy-faced shaman clustered around her in a tight circular formation. Crouched over the girl was a tall pot-bellied priest, his face dominated by a disgusting open-mouthed grimace of sadistic glee. Suspended from the acolyte's clenched right hand was a carven oval-faced mallet, which he weighed menacingly over the girl's shadowed face, an incoherent gibberish flowing from his grinning, thick-lipped mouth. In the face of the amorphous, broad-braided female stretched out alluringly before his gaping eyes, the universal whim of nature filing a plea of despair inside his white-hot soul, Grignir acted in the only manner he could perceive. Giving vent to a hoarse, throat-rending battle cry, Grignir plunged into the midst of the startled shaman, torch simmering in his left hand and axe whirling in his right hand. A giant skull-faced priest standing at the far side of the altar clutched desperately at his throat, coughing furiously in an attempt to catch his breath. 
lurching helplessly to and fro. The acolyte pitched headlong against the gleaming base of a massive jade idol. Writhing agonizedly against the hideous image, foam flecking his chalk white lips, the priest struggled helplessly, the victim of an epileptic seizure. Startled by the barbarian's stunning appearance, the chronic fit of their fellow, and the fear that Grignir might be the avant-garde of a conquering force dedicated to the cause of destroying their degenerated cult, the shaman momentarily lost their composure. Giving vent to heedless pandemonium, the priests fell easy prey to Grignir's sweeping arc of crimson death and maiming destruction. The acolyte performing the sacrifice took a vicious blow to the stomach, hands clutching vitals and severed spinal cords as he sprawled over the altar. The disorganized priest lurched and staggered with split skulls, dismembered limbs, and spewing entrails before the enraged accordion's relentless onslaught. The howls of the maimed and dying reverberated against the walls of the tiny chamber, a chorus of hell fraught despair as the granite floor ran red with blood. The entire chamber was encompassed in the heat of raw, savage butchery as Grignir luxuriated in the grips of a primitive, beastly bloodlust. Presently all went silent at save for the ebbing groans of the sinking shaman and Grignir's heaving breath accompanied by several dust gusty curses. The well had run dry. No more lambs remained for the slaughter. The rampaging stead of death having taken up Grignir for the moment left the barbarian free to the exploitation of his other perusials. Towering over his head was the misshaped image of the cult's hideous deity, Argon. The fantastic size of the idol and consideration of its being of pure jade was enough to cause the senses of any man to stagger and reel. Yet thus was not the case for the behemoth. He had paid only casual notice to this incredible fact while riveting the whole of his attention upon the jewel protruding from the idol's soul socket, its masterfully cut faucets emitting blinding rays of hypnotizing beauty. After all, a man cannot slink from a heavily guarded palace while burdened down by the intense bulk of a squatting statue, providing, of course, that the idol can even be hefted, which, in fact, was beyond the reaches of Grignir's coursing stamina. On the other hand, the jewel, gigantic as it was, would not present a hindrance of any mean concern. Help me, please, I can make it well worth your while, pleaded a soft, anguish-strown voice wafting over Grignir's shoulders as he plucked the dull red emerald from its roots. Turning, Grignir faced the female that had lured him into this bloodbath, but whom had become all but forgotten in the heat of the battle. You, ejaculated the accordion in a pleased tone. I thought that I had seen the last of you at the tavern, but verily I was mistaken. Grignir advanced into the grips of the female's entrancing stare, severing the golden chains that held her captive upon the altar's highly polished face of ornamental limestone. As Grignir lifted the girl from the altar, her arms wound dexterously around his neck, soft and smooth against its harsh exterior. Art thou pleased that we have chanced to meet once again? Grignir merely voiced in a side grunt, returning the damsel's embrace while he smothered her trim, delicate lips between the coursing protrusions of his reeking maw. Let us take leave of this wretched chamber, stated Grignir as he placed the female upon her feet. She swooned a moment, causing Grignir to give her her support, then regained her stance. Art thou liable to find your way through the cursed passages of this castle? Refrick! Every one of the corners of this damned place are identical. Ah, I was at one time a slave of Prince Agafim. His clammy touch sent a sour swill through my belly, but my efforts reaped a harvest. I gained the pig's liking, whereby he allowed me the freedom of the palace. It was through this means that I eventually managed to escape at the western gate. His trust found him with a dagger thrust his ribs, the wench stated whimsicorically. What were you doing in the tavern once I discovered you? asked Grignir as he lifted the female through the opening into the mausoleum. I had sought to lay low from the palace's guards as they conducted their search for me. The tavern was seldom frequented by the palace guards, and my identity was unknown to the common soldiers. It was through the disturbance that you caused that the palace guards were attracted to the tavern. I was dragged away shortly after you were escorted to the palace. What are you called by, female? Cathirna, daughter of Mincardos, Duke of Barwego, whose lands border along the northwestern fringes of Gorzom. I was paid as homage to Agafim upon his thirty-eighth year, Bust the Femme. And I am called a barbarian, grunted Grignir in a disgusted tone. Aye, the ways of our civilization are in many ways warped and distorted, but what is your calling, she queried bustily. Grignir of Accordia. Ah, I have heard vaguely of Accordia. It is the hill country in the far east of the Noriagolian Empire. I have also heard Agafim curse your land more than once when his troops were rooted in the unaccustomed mountains and gorges, saith she. Aye, my people are not tarnished by petty luxuries and baubles. They remain fierce and unconquerable in their native climes. 
After reaching the hidden panel at the head of the stairway, Grignir was at a loss in regard to its operation. His fiercest his were as pebbles against burnished armor. Carthina depressed a small symbol included within the elaborate design upon the panel, whereupon it slowly slid into a cleft in the wall.